Greetings and welcome to this mini lecture on A Brief History of Comics, Part 1. Uh, in this int introductory video, we're going to take a look at some of the major points in comics history and probably just a, a couple key artists or I think highly influential artists um, in the pre-comic book era. So this, this mini lecture will take us from kind of the, the early prototypical comics into right into the 1930s before comic books become something that is is omnipresent in popular culture. So the first thing we're going to actually take a look at is a couple things that aren't really comics but have elements of comics to them. The first is the Bayou ta Tapestry. Uh, and this was created sometime between the 11th and the 12th century uh, and it was an illustration of the Norman Conquest and it was a tapestry that was 1.6 I believe feet or meters wide I'm sorry uh, tall and 240 24 feet long. So this is a very, very long tapestry that tells the story of the Norman Conquest. And as you can see from this little, uh, the, this little excerpt that we have here, you know there is a sense of motion. There is a sense of of movement of the story progressing along. Um, and I think that's a you know a lot of people look at this as one of the earlier understood approaches to telling a story with images and words and as we can see this has both. Uh, the next strong example would be the stations of what are referred to as the Stations of the Cross uh, and you can actually find this in many different churches um, throughout the world and these were the 12 paintings or sometimes they're statues or sometimes they're uh, drawings but the basically 12 parts of Christ's crucifixion and death and it's fascinating because one of the reasons it was done in this way is if you look at the time 1300s the majority the vast majority of the people are illiterate and so what you have here is a sequence of images that tells a story again very similar to how we understand what comics do is that they communicate a story and so this idea that you know people could actually learn about what had occurred and each of these images are embedded with a variety of additional information it's not just one step but the way people are poised and positioned that tells us different things about what's going on in the quote unquote story William Hogarth's A Harlot's Progress is a collection of drawings that follow, of course, a harlot um, as she slips in further into uh, a, a undesirable life. And it, the drawings were, dr were created in response or as a parody of John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, which talks all about a pilgrim as he comes to find God. And so it's the satirical take on that. And it's very interesting in that, again, here is a, a work of sequential art. And more interesting is that it's a critical work. It's talking about or it's responding to other things, which is something that comics have also been known to do over the years. And then we get to what are considered the really first known or really first strong examples of what we know as comics and that's Rudolf Topher. Um, his work as you can see in this example you have a series of panels right we have panels and we have text and we have this idea of you reading one to the next to the next it's, it's an idea of a contained story on a singular page which we don't see with the predecessors. These, this is something that took place or this was part of a story that Topher is telling and this is really the first strong example. However, the first real powerful example, most meaningful example, comes from Richard Felton Occult uh, in his work with the Yellow Kid, which eventually gets turned into Hogan's Alley. Uh, it first appears in Truth, which is a magazine uh, from 1894 to 1895, and it was a series of black and white single panels. However, in May 1895, uh, it debuts in Pulitzer's The World, and this is one of the most interesting things about comics that not many people realize is that when they emerge as comic strips initially, they become major drivers of 
newspapers. And in fact, you see over the, over the early 1900s, there are battles between Pulitzer and Hearst, the two major uh, publishing magnates of the early 20th century, as they battle back and forth to try to get artists to do these drawings, to keep, to draw things that entice people, that entertain them. And as you can see in the panel on the right here, the yellow kid is the little kid in the front there wearing that yellow outfit. And he becomes quite popular and quite famous. And he, you know, he lives in Ho this area called Hogan's Alley, which is, you know, a rougher neighborhood. And as you can tell by the image, there's a lot of things that it's, there, there's a lot of interesting things going on there. One of my favorite early artists is Winsor McKay. I think he, he doesn't get as much attention as he probably should, given just how phenomenal his work is um, over the years. Uh, he's a he becomes he's well known for being a comic artist, but he's also dabbled in lots of things, including uh, early animation. And his earliest, uh, you know, one of the most earliest ca cartoons to ever emerge was from Windsor McKay, uh, and it is a cartoon called Gertie the Dinosaur. And I would encourage you to go Google that, and you can pull up also you can pull it up on uh, YouTube or any other channel. But he writes us, he has several different well known series. His first one that, that we'll talk about is Tales of the Jungle Imps. Now, if that doesn't, if that name in and of itself doesn't tell you anything, I can tell you right now, it was a highly, uh, highly racist depiction uh, comic strip. And, and, you know, Jungle Imps is, is a very racial, a very horrible racial term for. Africans, and the story is all about this these these Africans that run around in the jungle. So, you know, th there's there's some trouble and issue that comes with this is with looking at that particular series, but we see later on as he starts dream of a rare of a rare beat bit fiend in Little Nemo in Slumberland, um, some of those ideas uh, and representations of race still come up and still challenging. But if we look at this example on the right, which is Little Nemo, he also does some fascinating things in comics that aren't be aren't being done previously. He plays around with the panels, and you know you can read his stuff, and it feels very surreal. It feels very exotic. It feels very interesting. The perspective that he has taken or that he can communicate within his comic. They're, they're just such powerful pieces and I can e easily understand how people flock to these. We're dying to see what happened to Nemo this week because he has such radical and one would probably also say trippy adventures. Alright, then one of the other big ones that we get to is George Joseph Harriman. Um, his famous work is Crazy Cat, um, and that has a, a run of almost 30 years, uh, and first appears in Hearst's New York Evening Journal. Uh, but of course, it will occasionally jump and move around. And this, this series has given birth to a great many examples that we are familiar with uh, within popular culture. This is the predecessor to Tom and Jerry, or if you're a fan of The Simpsons, Itchy and Scratchy. The, this is a cat and a mouse that are constantly in conflict, constantly one's throwing, you know, playing a trick around the other. And typically, each one ends with the... Uh, with Ignatz, the mouse, deciding to throw a brick at Crazy Cat. Um, so it's a very, it's a very, you know, quirky, short, pithy uh, comic strip, but it's one that sticks around and gets a lot of attention and has a lot of influence up through even today's culture. All right, so a couple of things to note about the trends in early comics. The first is that technology was needed for mass production. Uh, We've talked about before how mass print needed, you know, a actually needed the printing press. Well, that printing press needs to become even more technologically developed to not just reproduce the the typed word, but also to reproduce images. And that's a big thing for that holds comics back is you know from being popular culture is that they can't be mass produced. Once they can, they really do explode and they become a very, very, I would say, reasonably strong influence on popular culture. Um, and as, we noticed, as we've noted before, that something that's mass 
produced is often undervalued, and in the 20th century, comics, despite their influence on a variety of ways, are significantly undervalued, and we'll look at that when we, particularly when we get into the second uh, part of comics history and when we get into talking about uh, horror comics and, and kind of how and what has happened to comics over the last hundred years. Um, but we should note that comic strips helped drive newspapers. Newspapers sold, but as comics come into the fray, they sell even more because comics become appealing not just to the literate, but to the illiterate. They become appealing to the immigrant. They become pe appealing to people who, who, whose English is not their first language, and they can use comics actually to help them learn. Um, and the early comic strip artists were predominantly male. Um, and again, this is something we'll see within popular culture, particularly within comics, is a overwhelming uh, privilege or an overwhelming uh, male creation, uh, even though the readership is much bigger. There's many males and females that are reading comics, comic strips and comic books, but it's a predominantly male area for creation. Um, in that you see a lot of these early comic artists dabble in different areas. Um, I know one that we didn't get to, uh, but uh, Miles Goss, Windsor McKay, George Harriman, they all mixed around. They didn't just focus on comics. They got into animation. They got into film. Uh, they really did try to play around and, th and, and see these things in different lights um, or be influenced by these different mediums uh, in the work that they did. And finally, you know, we're, we've been talking about comic strips, and the next step from within the history is you go from comic strips to comic books. Um, and the development of comics and the types of stories that we tell with comics was hugely influenced by the explosion of pulp fiction, radio shows, and films from the 1910s really up through the 1930s. That this is going to shape the types of stories, the 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 action oriented the emphasis on action um, and also just you know the the way in which people think of them as serial right everything prior to comics you have pulp fiction you have radio you even have film serials all of these things are going to influence that idea of an ongoing story that does not does never really end all right that's all for now thank you very much for watching and i'll see you in the next video